Good afternoon, everybody. This is John Barrows with Make It Happen Monday, and I can't tell you how excited I am for today's guest because I've been working with this gentleman for the past mm, eight or nine years or so, and uh, the alignment between what we've been doing has been fantastic, and also he's become a very good friend of mine, so I'd like to introduce you all to my good friend, Kyle Porter over at Sales Loft. Hey, Kyle, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing very well. Hey, everybody. Excited to be here, John. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, we always have a blast getting together, but I haven't had the opportunity to be on a Make It Happen Monday yet, so this is an honor for me, and uh, my goal today is to, to um, share transparently, maybe drop a few pieces of information that can hopefully be helpful to the audience. Uh, if you get one thing out of it, I'll be happy, and uh, let, let's dive right in, man. I'm excited. Yeah, this has been a long time coming, I think. I've been, I've been trying to er, er, get us to the point where I think it was worth you and I having this conversation, and, and now it's ready for a couple of reasons. One is where we are in the marketplace right now, and two is what we have coming up here in the next couple of weeks, which I, think, which I am fired up about, which is Rainmaker 19, right? That's right. Rainmaker March 11th, 12th, and 13th in Atlanta, Georgia. We'll have 1,500 modern sales professionals here, the best of the best, and uh, there's a lot of things going on that will make this really valuable and relevant. I know a lot of your audience is already going to be here, um, but we'd love to see uh, we love to see more people sign up and get get down here for Rainmaker. Yeah. The, list, the list is 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 getting uh, um, it's getting closer and closer to the date where my marketing team turns off the ticket sales. <laughs> yeah, and, and and trust me, I know those sales are going well too because uh, I've actually put together me and my team. My whole team's going to be there. This is the first time the whole Jay Barrows team and not just me are going to be down there. Um, so we're fired up for this, and also some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about in, in our conversation, which is, you know, the difference between sales ready messaging versus marketing messaging, where things are going um, and what we need to be paying attention to, which is really what I want to dive into here. But I, just as some quick context for everybody out there, how Kyle and I know each other. Um, so I, I want to say about eight or nine years ago, I did a training, right? And, you know, everybody knows that, you know, well, people who follow me know like the why you, why you now, you know, like the Jeff Hoffman, the one that he came up with, right? And it's all about doing some personalization, right? You're going on somebody's website, being like, hey, what's up? I was researching, I saw this, let's talk about it, boom, right? Sending it out to an executive. And we, we do these live application in class. And one kid actually sent you an email during class. And, and do you remember what you did with it? Well, I, uh, I remember I had received a lot of terrible sales emails and we weren't in the sales engagement category yet as a company. Uh, but we were thinking a lot about how to deliver a customer with a better experience. And I got this guy's email and I remember being blown away at the quality of it. And so I turned around and wrote a blog post and included the email in the blog post. And, uh, and that's how we got to know each other. Yeah. And actually that kid was so fired up. He actually sent me your blog post. It was like, dude, check this out. I sent it to a CEO, you know, and he, and he actually wrote a blog post about it. I was like, <laughs> so then I kind of pinged you. I was like, yo, what's up? I trained that kid. You want to talk? Um, and that would, that's what uh, kind of started us along the path. And then, like I said, I think uh, you and I are in violent agreement about a lot of different stuff, personally and professionally. And, and like I said, I appreciate our friendship. That, that, that we, we only got. disagree when it comes to professional sports teams, but you, uh, you seem to win that one pretty frequently. <laughs> yeah, we're in the golden age right now in New England sports, so I, I won't run that too. And, and again, for oh man, for those people who don't remember who weren't there, two years ago, Kyle and I had a bet about the Atlanta Super Bowl. And I will say, actually, I still got it right here, as a matter of fact. Oh, are you, you know, kidding me? You know, I'm going to bring it up. Man, Kyle had to wear a Tom Brady jersey up on stage at Rainmaker in front of like. Put that down now. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, but one of the things I've always admired. I took a shower about, right after. <laughs> hey, you're lucky, by the way, because that was a, that was I've I've never even worn that jersey. That was a sign autographed by Tom Brady game day jersey. I've never even worn it. So you're the only one who's ever worn it. So if that makes you feel any better. Greatness recognize greatness, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, so, but it kind of leads to, you know, one of the things I've always said and admired about you is your, the ability for you to evolve, right? I mean, when you said you were just thinking about the sales engagement when that email hit you, right? I remember the first time we got together, or the first time I noticed what you were doing and what you had put together, it was, um, it was like giving alerts off of LinkedIn, right? Like when somebody moved a job, it would be like, oh, Kyle just went from X to Y company, right? And that to me, and that was before LinkedIn could do it. Yep. And that to me was like, holy shit, this is fantastic. And then I remember you shutting it down. And I'm like, dude, what the hell are you doing? Like, I'm telling all my clients about this. I think this is fantastic. 
But what were you seeing, right? Because because there's another step and then another step, and you kept shutting things down and reinventing yourself. Could you give the, the team a little bit of context on that? Because I think that evolution is going to feed well into our conversation here. Yeah, so short story is I've been a salesperson my entire life, going back to childhood where I was selling Beanie Babies, baseball cards, comic books, figurines, um, Olympic pins, uh, you know, 1996. And and what I did is I just love the look on someone's eyes when you could deliver them something that they, they couldn't get anywhere else, they really, really wanted, that they were struggling to find on their own. And, and that just invigorated me. And as I got into professional selling, what I recognized is that I was doing really well selling. I was making six figures first year out of school, selling in the corporate environment and doing it by understanding my customer, by being able to lead with understanding their challenges and problems and connecting with them authentically. And I called it at the time, just relationship selling, right? And then later, uh, you know, I realized that not everyone in sales really, you know, behaved that way. And the sales profession had this other reputation and I was disgusted by it. And so when I started Sales Loft, I had one mission was to bring sincerity into the profession of sales. And that led us to try a lot of different things in order to, to identify products that would help sellers connect more authentically and deliver more value to their customers. And we'd try something and we'd spin it up and we'd see where the problems and the difficulties were. You know, that was one of the products, but another one was a data service that we, that we built. And it would let individuals create or companies create these accurate and targeted lists of leads. And what I realized is that, you know, this thing took off, by the way, it went from 0 million to 7 million in a two year period of time. But I canceled that product because it didn't match with our values. And what I recognize is that these companies were buying these, this service, to generate this long list of leads and then they were dropping it in the marketing automation spam blaster or some of these mail merge you know automation engines and they were just turning the wheel and it disgusted me and so what we wanted to do is identify what are the best sellers in the world doing and they are understanding who their buyers are they're targeting the right accounts they're finding the personas in those accounts and then they're tailoring the messaging over a series of communications phone calls and emails over periods of time we said, let's build this, man. Let's build something that helps this workflow that so, so that reps can, can deliver a better experience to the seller. So it's always been the same North Star, but just trying different ways to get there. But what would you, would you skip there, which I think is important for any entrepreneur out there who's listening. And, and, and so, you know, a lot about this podcast is a lot about tactical execution things, but it's also about kind of aspirations, right? Like a lot of people that listen here, they want to be an entrepreneur. They want to start their own business and but they might be afraid to, or they might be holding on to something that they don't think is that they know could be better, but they're afraid because they might've gotten some money. I mean, you had investors that got you from zero to 7 million and, and you had a legit company going and you just shut it, you just shut it down, right? Like, and you went back to them and said, yeah, sorry, I know I have a super successful company. I'm gonna bail on that and start a different one. Is that cool with you? Is that pretty much what you did? I mean, give or take. Yeah, you know, what we also did at the same time is we went on a whiteboard and drew out the future for the sales engagement market and this was in 2014. And one of the biggest investors that I know in Atlanta, he came in, saw that presentation and wanted to invest in the future of that product. Gotcha. So we, we had this lifeline into the, into the future, okay. uh, you know, the backs of our investors and, and, and they were long-term believers in the vision as well. So it, was, uh, it wasn't a super hard sell. Yeah. It was a hard sell internally to the staff, especially the reps who were crushing it, selling that old product and making a ton of money with something that was easy to sell, that the customer understood, that they were getting paid well on. I mean, that was the difficulty. And we had a, a tombstone in the corner of the office, RIP Sales Loft Prospector. We played that song and I sung a dust in the wind. <laughs> we had to, you know, we had to memorialize the moment and yep. it was harder internally than anywhere else. And, and some customers didn't like it also, but you know, we've, we've since shown those customers a better way. And that again, from a business develop, from a business building business standpoint, um, one of the other things I have always admired is the culture that you've created at Sales Loft. You know, I, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If there's one company that I would ever work for ever again in my life, and I won't because I'm a pain in the ass to work for and and with, but if there was, it'd be Sales Loft, and it's because of that culture that you've created there. Thank you. And, and That's an honor. And and I'm and I'm dead serious about that. Um, you know, for anybody listening out there, so. And one of the things that I think you do a really good job of, and I try to do as a leader myself, is paint the vision, right? You talk about that vision. 
Because I always say you can't get people to do more than what you're asking for from them unless they understand the vision of where you're going and how they fit into that. So how do you constantly live? Um, you know, I want to get into the, the future where, where sales engagement is going, but a nice little sidebar here on, the, on culture. How do you live the your values, if you will, and make sure that people are bought into this. Cause you've done some stuff at sales law from a cultural standpoint that I, I rarely see in most organizations. You know, I think I got lucky. I had a, a crazy childhood a early past and we can get into that later or maybe another day. But uh, what happened was, is I, I started to find myself being real transparent and vulnerable and authentic in my life. And what happened was the ROI on that authenticity was through the roof. And so I just kept doing it and doing it, and doing it. It felt good. And, and so for me, this business is a direct reflection of who I am, what I believe and what I believe that, that others should believe. And so from the very beginning, it was, how do we bring a level of, of sincerity to sales? How do we activate the authentic seller in everyone? Right? And so I wake up with that mission and passion. And then the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to create an environment where others could come to learn more, do more and become more to take the talents and skills that they had been given and that they had earned and use those to make the world a different place, to make it a better place to, to find fulfillment. And so that's what this company's all about. And I wanted to do that even before I knew it was going to be called sales loft, even before I had the domain. Right. And so that was where it, what it all began. And so we just, you know, we work really hard to make sure everyone is, is on board with the North star here, that the, the, the values and the shared behaviors are behaviors that they hold deep in their heart and that they want to get better and better and better at. And then we, uh, you know, we create an environment for where if that's not the case, then you're going to not want to be here. And if it is, you're going to find tons of, you're going to thrive in this environment if you do. And, and so we wake up every day with our people, you know, loving our people so they can turn around and love on our customers. And, uh, and it's, it's worked out so, so far. It's, it's difficult. It's, you know, it's, it's actually not complex, but it's very, very, very hard yeah. is the best way I would describe it. You know, to live a values oriented uh, purpose-driven, mission-led company. It's just, it's kind of blocking and tackling, uh, but it's really hard blocking and tackling. Well, especially as you grow, like, I mean, how many employees are you up to now? We're 360 today. Shit, man. 360? <laughs> Shit. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I have like 20, 30, 40, 50 people, no problem, right? All of a sudden you break on, into a hundred and now you got, pro now you got problems, right? More money, more problems. So, so <laughs> how do you, like, let me ask you my own genuine curiosity here. Like, what is your approach to like mission statements and, and, and those type of things? And do you have one in the why, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. what I see a lot of companies is they come up like the, the founders come up with some mission statement with some consultant or whatever it is that they beat each up over other couple of words and then they throw it up on a board, but they don't live it. So do you guys yeah. have a defined mission statement or is it constantly evolving? And, and I mean, yeah. what's that North star for you? Uh, we absolutely do. And it does, tweak from time to time as I get smarter about the language that would go into it, but the whole entire philosophy of it never changes. And so from the beginning, I used to use those words sincerity in sales. I don't, I don't use that as much. What we say is the purpose of the business is to activate the authentic seller in everyone, right? And so it starts right there. What's the, what's the reason this business even exists? Because if it was wow. to make money, there's a hundred different things I could go do to make money, right? And, um, and, and I've already made money and you know, that's fine, but that's not, that's not enough. That's not what it's all about. And so I believe a company's purpose should really, you, you can kind of ask the question like why five times yep. to get to the real, real, real why behind it. Yep. And it should be something that's one stop short of saving the world, you know, making the world a better place. And for us, activating the authentic seller and everyone does make the world a better place. So that's our purpose as a business. And if you're about to be hired, whether you're a QA engineer or an accountant, a salesperson, an executive, if you don't believe that that's a worthwhile cause, then there's no reason to be here. You know what I'm saying? And so it starts there. And then the mission is a little more concrete about what the business does every day. And so our mission is to empower our customers to enable their reps to deliver the best sales experience in a way that generates the most revenue for their companies. So that's, that's the mission of the company. And then we have our values, which service and customer first, that's number one, uh, team over self, which is like Michael Jordan in the, in the championship days before Michael Jordan, the scoring leader days. Um, it's uh, biased action. I think you know a little bit about that. Um, it is, um, it is um, focus on results. Uh, focus on the results is a formula that we have that is be authentic and transparent and admit mistakes and weaknesses so that we can 
dive in together and solve problems with conflict so we can make commitments to each other so we can hold each other accountable and when we do that we have a focus on results and uh what did i say i said biased action team over self um uh i said um what was one of, oh glass half full is the fifth one and glass half full is it's not like uh everything's wine and roses you know me i'm a realist right i'm not thinking like everything's sunshine but what i do is i recognize the whole situation for everything that it is and that's what our us as lofters do we recognize the good, the bad, the ugly, but we select the positive path forward. So we make that decision to go forward positively. And those make up the values. And we're looking for those to live in your heart before you join the company. But you don't need to be tens on all of them, right? You might be a seven on one. You might be a nine and a half on the other. And what we want is for you to come in hoping that you can take that seven and turn it into an eight, right? And it's been cool for me because, you know, just even just speaking about them over and over and over again, hiring on them, reprimands, praises, promotions, everything on these values. It's caught me in a situation where I found myself taking kind of that negative step and I go, oh, whoops, turn back this way, right? So I caught myself in course correct in the moment. And a great mentor told me that leadership is when you can make great course corrections. And the ultimate leadership is when you can make a great course correction without having to make the mistake first. Nice, I love that. And, and for those of you listening out there, I, I can't tell you how important this is as far as what, what Kyle just mapped out there. And because I went, I actually went through that process of, uh, at the Gary V 4D session where you go to Gary V's office and, and really what they focus on is the why, right? Like, why are you doing what you're doing? And, 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 you know, ours is sales done right, right? I actually have it, you know, sales done right. And then, you know, our, our values too. And I actually, a long time ago, I put together... I don't know where I got, this was literally like 20 years ago when I first started, when I was a first VP in my first startup, you know, I, I came up with my 12 guiding, you know, guiding principles, right, of how I live my life. And it was work hard and smart, you know, always ask for feedback, you know, pa find your passion or find something else to do, like all those things. And I remember using, and I still have it to this day, it's right there. Um, and I, and I would, anytime I would hire a rep, I would, I would say, look, these are my values. This is where I'm coming from. I just want to let you know when my feet, when, when you get feedback from me, this is where it comes from. Now at the time I didn't say you had to live these values too, because they were just mine. Right. But, but at least you understood where I was coming from. And so everybody knew exactly when, when I said work hard and smart and I, and you went home at four 30 in the afternoon and I was a little bit annoyed with you because I was <laughs> in the clock at night, you kind of knew where that was coming from. Right. Yeah. I love so it. Understanding like why and understanding your values is critical to success in business. I mean, if you're building a business, but also if you're looking for a job, right? Because if I'm, if I'm looking for a job and, and, you know, I look at the first thing I'm going to look at, first of all, can I believe in the product? But then I can, I believe in the company yeah. and then, you know, what is their mission? What is their purpose? Do they give back and do that? Do their values align with mine? Because if they don't, I ain't going to, I'm not going to be successful there. Right. That's right. Love it, man. And actually, small sidebar on this one, leadership. Did you see what happened? So I, I, I don't want to go into too much sports here, but I, I'm curious on your perspective on this one. The, um, when the Patriots, like this past Super Bowl, the, the coach on the Rams, did you see what he said at the end of the game? Did he say something about getting beat? He said something about, but the, it's the way he said it that I'm actually kind of curious. I'm genuinely curious about your, your position on this. Because what he said, what, I mean, he was a Bill, I forget what his name is, but, but he's like a Bill Belichick, like, oh my God, like, I love you, Bill Belichick, right? And he even, you saw him before the game being like, man, I appreciate everything you've done for the game and everything. Like afterwards, he said, he said, I flat out got out coached. And it was an emotional thing and it was a transparent thing. And it was, it was, I mean, you could tell it was right. I was like, I, I got smoked. I got out coached by Bill Belichick. Now, my question for you is the nuances matter on this one, right? Because my, I was curious on how that affected his team because Bill Belichick never says I got out coached. He always says I could have coached better. Hmm. So their coach, like literally admitting defeat, my question is, is, and, and t saying, like, straight up, I got coached. Fast forward next year, the Patriots are in the Super Bowl with the Rams again. If you're on his team, are you walking in there being like, we're going to win one for our team because our coach, because, we, you know, he's better this year and that type of thing, and he was transparent with us? Or are you walking into that game going, man, our, Bel Belichick's in our coach's head and we're already lost here because Belichick is still better than our coach. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I think it all depends on what happens after this in those in those rooms that we won't see. You know, when he addresses the team after the game, what 
what are the addendums that he throws on that, right? Because if he says, I got out coached and I can do better and I'm going to get him, you know, I mean, that's a different story, right? But I mean, I can coach better is kind of the same thing as I got out coached also, right? I mean, it, to me, it feels like it may, it, at the end of the day, it is actually the same thing. If you didn't get if you didn't coach well enough, then you got out coached. It is, but I, I do think nuances matter. Like I got, I got smoked versus I could get better. It's kind of glass half empty, glass half full approach. Yeah. yeah. Right. But so it's also, a, if it's not the final statement, right. It, the declarative statement is, is the follow up. And if that's all he said on, on this camera, then he left an opportunity behind to say, you know, Hey, reality is X future is Y. Right. My I guess the, my question, I guess that's your philosophy on, cause you said transparency has, has helped you throughout your, and I'm the same way, man. I, I always tell people I'm the worst liar you'll ever come across. <laughs> I suck. I just suck at lying. So I guess, is there a threshold for transparent as a business leader? Is there a threshold of transparency that, that you have to be wary of? I mean, I've told my staff about my childhood insecurities and the time I got arrested. I mean, you know, like where's, where's the line? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess from a business standpoint, you know what I mean? Because there's investors, there's money involved. Yeah. In doing. There's, well, there's a, things you can't do, like you can't share salaries and things like that. And if, if there's lawsuits or, you know, anything like there's things that you, sh you just can't do fiscally or, or through corporate responsibility. But, you know, for me, I always, I always play the game of, um, you know, here's who I am. Here's what happened. Here's the situation. And here's what's going to happen going forward. That's the piece. That's where I'm, you know, that's where I'm aggressive. That's the piece. And I think that's the piece that, that I thought that the coach missed a little bit there, which is, you know what? I got smoked, Belichick killed, but man, I can't wait for next year type of yeah. scenario, right? So let's talk about next year. He's not going to get me again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk about next year um, as far as future and evolution, because we've set the stage here, you know, evolving businesses, having a vision, those type of things. Sales engagement right now, all right? I personally think we're in this transition phase right now of sales in general. And I'm going to put, to put a couple of benchmarks here. Generationally, right? When I grew up, you know, Gen Xer, right? You're a, like, it was a numbers game. It was a pure numbers game. So it was like, hey, make a 50 dials, make a 100 dials, whatever it was, right? We've now evolved into a world where we understand quality matters, right? Account-based marketing, you know, buyer intent, those type of things. But because Gen Xers right now are the, the leaders, if you will, it's really hard to coach against quality. It's hard to coach quality, right? It's easy to coach against numbers. So as much as a manager wants to coach, you know, hell, let me show you how to be authentic and all this other stuff. It's, it's a lot easier for me to admit, hey, Kyle, did you make your 50 dials today? So I think we're in this weird world where everybody understands quality is the answer, but we're still cranking on numbers, right? Yeah, and yeah. You know, we're short term, it's monthly quotas for reps, you know, Wall Street's beating up these publicly traded companies to go, go, go at all costs, right? So we're in, I think, a understand, you know, future's important and all that other stuff, but short term, I got to hit my numbers and I got to do my thing and I get managed that way. So I think we're in a transition and I think a lot of technology, a lot of people right now are teaching the technology on how to do our jobs that eventually is going to come and replace a lot of what we're doing. And that's where I see sales engagement right now is a lot of these reps are using these sales engagement tools as, as sales automation tools. So, so with that, where do you see this going? And, and, and let's focus on just, I know the, the, the vision of, of um, sales loft is to really get all aspects of a business from a sales engagement, customer success, account managers, uh, account executives and SDRs and BDRs. But let's focus specifically right now on the outbound engagement. Yeah, prospecting. Yeah. And where, development. Where, because you are actually in this more than I am from a tech standpoint. So where do you see this two, three, four, five years out? Yeah. Well, the first thing you said, it reminded me of a quote from Danny Meyer. Danny Meyer is the founder of Union Square Restaurant Group and Shake Shack. It's a $4 billion burger joint, right? He's going to be coming to Rainmaker. He's one of the keynotes. And what he says is he says, because he owns this fine dining white tablecloth, number one restaurant in New York, and says, you know, it's easy to coach someone on how to set a table beautifully. Yep. It's impossible to coach them to want to set the table beautifully. Yep. And so that goes into selection on the front end. In leadership, the first step in leadership is attracting the right talent. Second step is inspiring that talent, right? Fueling the flame. And then the third step is developing that talent. 
So that's what leadership's all about. And I, I totally agree that we are walking this thin line with our account development practices, with our prospecting practices, because on one hand, we know that customers demand and desire and deserve an authentic, relevant, engaging, human, one-to-one, -one, sincere, problem-solving experience, right? They demand that. Yep. But companies, their organizations, they want predictable, scalable, repeatable, steeped in process, yep. forecastable. You know, they have to have that in order to get the financing, in order to get the growth, in order to get the budget, in order to get the hires, right? So sales becomes this harmonious blend of these two things that are really in conflict with each other, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens is a lot of technology is saying, taking this side of the automated, scalable, predictable, and they're saying, let's speed it up, let's accelerate it, more activities, more, you know, crush your sales, crush your calls, crush your this, crush your that. And what's happening is they're losing that actual part that matters the most of this human engagement uh, component of sales. And so a lot of these sales engagement companies, you know, their billboard would read, uh, you know, uh, make thousands of phone, crush the phone calls, you know, and like that kind of thing. And what ours would read is deliver a better sales experience. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, the customer gives zero shits about your process. Yeah. Like, like, oh, you got automation? Don't give a shit. Oh, you got some scalable things? I don't care. What am I going to get out of this? And I better get solutions to my problems, right? So I think that's the biggest thing that you have to think about when you come into this market. Now, the next thing is, is that in order to provide that authentic service, it is very, very, very difficult to do it with any sort of speed, with any sort of volume, with any sort of coverage amongst your accounts. So the goal of sales engagement should be to eliminate the routine tasks and free the rep up to better understand their buyer, to better be uh, educated in, in, in business concepts so that they can consult and serve and solve for their customers, right? So I think that's the way we look at it. And then the big, big, big thing down the road is, okay, and it's happening now, you know, with our company and what we do in sales engagement, we provide phone solutions, email solutions, social LinkedIn solutions, and other types of offline communications. And we get to see all of those activities, all of them. And then we get to see which ones worked and which ones didn't, yeah. for which personas, in which industries, at what ACVs, at what rep types, at what buyer profile. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is now we've got this machine learning that can guide these sellers and it can guide them in the moment, educating them real time as they're acting. And it's not based on all the knowledge we know across all the users, it's based on their specific situation. So each person gets their own ad hoc or bespoke uh, sales engagement coaching, but at the end of the day, they're still the ones connecting. They're still the ones asking those difficult questions, making those difficult, difficult challenges to the buyers, bringing the right people into the mix. So I believe that's the future of sales engagement. Do you think that the SDR role, um, cause I'm curious here. My, so look, here's what my thought is. And I'd love to get the where if you think I'm right or if what your thoughts are on it, which is the SDR role right now, right? The, the, the ones that do the outbounds. Okay. Yep. Um, I personally think that's going to turn a little bit more, a lot more and shift under, to, under the marketing operations side than it is the sales side. Cause historically it's been the feeder system, right? Ever since predictable revenue came out and all that other stuff, it was, all right, come in here, do some inbounds, right? Now go graduate to outbounds, then go graduate to AE, right? And, or inside sales and then close SMD mid market and enterprise. And now that's the journey of a sales rep. I, I fundamentally believe because of solutions like yours, that the SDR role is gonna become, first of all, I think it's gonna become its own uh, pillar, if you will, in the sales process. In the sense, it's not gonna be a feeder system. It's gonna be, I'm gonna be an SDR, I'm gonna be SDR manager, I'm gonna be SDR VP. But I think it's gonna align with sales, uh, with marketing and operations because it's gonna be so much more, to your point, um, using the data, using the insights, leveraging the messaging and all that and putting it together to engage with that specific prospect and then analyzing the results. And let's be just very clear on this. That is not a, currently, that is not a sales rep skill as far as looking at data, analyzing results and make, that's usually more under marketing and operations. 
So my, that's my belief is that what the, the skill set is going to need to change from being a sales superstar and knowing how to have a conversation with somebody and that type of thing and relationship developers to uh, somebody who can analyze and, and put the pieces together and then look at the results. So A, what do you think of that? B, if that is true, what what's now the new entree into sales, if you will, like a full cycle sales rep? Is it going to go back to what you and I started with, which is here's your territory, good luck. You have to prospect, you know, yeah, you're going to get inbounds and you're going to get leads given to you, but you still have to go out there and close your own. Where, what, where do you see that? Yeah, so I do agree that sales development sits square, sits between sales and marketing. I may have some disagreement on how close it gets to marketing because sales development has two components to it. It has the operational component to it, mm -hmm. which is content, templates, snippets, automation rules, distribution of accounts, you know, filling in personas. It's all those things that are very operational, mm -hmm. but then it requires the rep to make a tweak at the last minute of all of these communications. There's really two types of cadences. There's a straight automated one, and then there's a teed up one. And the teed up one is beautiful because what it does is it can take all the different industries of your buyer, all the different personas of your buyer, all the different things that are happening in the market, all the different matchups with your solution, and it can deliver the rep right before they hit send an email that looks pretty damn good, right? But what the rep has the opportunity to do is turn that from an email template that looks pretty damn good to being an email that the owner, that the receiver of that email will know was sent authentically. And my best example for this is I woke up at 4 a.m. on Thanksgiving morning with about 20 people in my farmhouse in Central Florida. Before they woke up, woke up, I went to the computer and I opened up Sales Loft and I had a cadence that I had built and it had at the time about 330 employees of Sales Loft and it had a single template thanking them for being part of this mission and helping us achieve everything that we have. Because I was really grateful to the staff and I wanted to share that with them. What I did is I tweaked every single one of those emails before I hit send so that when they received it, they know that I put thought into that and that I cared about them specifically. And the difference is just that much work for that much impact. And so what happened was is I got about 70 emails back by noon that day and they said things like, I just showed your email to my grandmother to show her how proud I am of the company I work with. That's awesome. And that's the difference, right? Because they all would have been able to sniff it out if it had just been, hey, name. Yeah. You know, you've been at the company for increased ten insert tenure, right? And I'm glad you're working in insert department, right? And, uh, and I just wanted to say I'm so grateful for you to be part of this journey versus, hey, it was great to see you in the hallway on Thursday. Yeah. Hey, I saw that you just launched this awesome campaign. I was really proud. Or, hey, we haven't even met yet, but I know Brian's really excited to bring you on the team. And I heard him say something about it when he hired you, right? And like, those are some of those emails. And, uh, and it was just, it was a difference maker. And so that's what we want to do empowering salespeople is give them the opportunity to make that difference in the last moment. And that's why, as long as they have operational support, that that's the on road to being a closer because you're starting to know how to connect in a way that allows you to persuade. Okay. I, so I see that, that the nuance there makes a difference, right? But it's the, the challenge is, is to your point of the hiring of that person that does give a shit about making that, the, the setting the table that right. It was a way yeah. as opposed to showing them how to do it. Right. Right. And I, cause I think, you know, that was funny. One of the things when I go back to Gary Vee and I went to his 4D session, I asked him, cause I was a little bit, this was about three years ago. I, w I will say I was to a certain degree freaking out about the old artificial intelligence thing. I'm like, holy shit. Cause I'm seeing emails that were more personalized than I could write. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I asked him, I go, what is it? Where does that leave us? And he goes, don't fight it. You know, you're not going to fight it. It's, it's, it's coming and it's coming strong. But he said exactly what you just said there, which is be the rep that, 
before the AI email goes out, because there's always going to be something that a human can sniff out that says that wasn't written by a human. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it uses first name, last name, you know, those type of things as opposed to just the first name or, you know, it says something that's, yeah, but that's not how a normal person talks, right? So be that last mile. And I think that's the key is be that last mile. And your data even proves that. One of the things that shocked me, you have that new sales development report that just, that, that you just yeah. posted recently. You know what, like, it is, 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 it was surprising and a little frustrating to me, um, but also but also a little encouraging was the, the 20%, right? The, 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 the optimal sales email is 20% personalized, which I'm like, okay, but what in contrast to 100% personalized? Yeah. I, like 100% personalized was, was, was like the graph was, was, yeah, the graph was like, all right, from zero to 20%, it's not that great. But then from 20 to 80, per 20 to 90%, it's actually, you know, pretty equal. And then it fell off the map at 100. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why do you think a 20% personalized email, I get the scale version of that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Get load more at that point. But why do you think the 20% personalization was so much more effective than 100%? I mean, I am genuinely curious on that yeah. right there. So what we're looking we've looked into that and what we've identified is that the team is writing decent templates the teams are writing decent templates and those may match up with the 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 need in the market with the solution that they saw for and people are getting better and better and better at writing good templates you're helping them do that right and but when you go all the way off the deep end now you're going completely rogue and you've got these junior people that may not understand these value props the same way, and they're rewriting the value prop of their organization. And so what we found is, is that taking the, the, the tried and true principles of the proposition and the need and the problem in the market, but then throwing that twist in there that shows the buyer, I'm tuned into you, I'm paying attention, I care about your business, I've got some intelligence, and I'm here to serve and solve your problems that opens the door for that interaction to happen. And so I think that's why that, that early, uh, you know, personalization is making an impact and then a ladder is falling off. Yeah. And I think that it kind of goes all into, you know, my whole riff on context content, right? And, and this is where sales and marketing, right? Marketing is content. Sales is context. Yeah. If we sales professionals are not putting any context around our content, we're no different than marketing and I have no idea why we're getting paid to do what we do. And the only thing that works if it's robotic sales engagement or robotic automation, and the only thing that works is if you just happen to land on it, you know, demand that was there and it matches the value prop. I mean, the demand has to be there and if the demand's already there, they probably already started down the path. If they've already started down the path, then you're an also ran, right? You're not shaping the, the vision for them. And so I think that's a really important concept as well. Awesome, man. We well, see a lot of times companies with, um, you know, attractive products in the market that resort to um, more robotic approaches. Yeah. And it's really weird because what happens is they see early success. Yeah. Because they target those customers that kind of know or want or they're you know, a good, good fit and they get great responses. And then they decide they want to move upstream or stop selling to venture back SaaS companies, right? And they send those emails to manufacturing companies and financial services companies and healthcare companies. And those guys are just like, delete, 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 spam, spam, spam. And then the companies are shocked and they're like, we have to go and really sell. You know? And then they have to rewind all those old habits to get better at going to market. Yeah, they probably abused, you know, the, the conversion ratios matter, right? Because I've, I've had this, and I'm not going to bring up another trainer, but, you know, we have yeah. different philosophies. There's this one trainer out there that like literally litters the C-suite with very templated emails and asks for, hey, who can I talk to about this and gets the referral down and focuses on that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You want to be thoughtful if you're going to do that. You want to, and he's like, yeah, but I, you know, I can send out 500 emails in 10 minutes and get five responses where you're going to take two or three hours to send 20 emails that get five responses. So I'm better than you. And I go, no, 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 you're not. <laughs> right? Because you just probably piss off 995 people that you're not going to be able to go back to. Right. And we all well, know the quality of your responses are going to be higher too. Oh, absolutely. A response is not a response is not a response. Exactly. So, you know, I think that's something for, for reps to pay attention to is that when you got 495 bad tastes in mouths. <laughs> right. Exactly. And then all of a sudden it's just going to be like, okay, take me off your list. And I even guess if you come authentic, they're like, oh yeah, you're the guy that sent me that BS. Right. 
And that actually leads me to kind of my, I, I mean, we, you and I could talk all day, but, but one of my last topics I wanted to hit on with you here is the difference between sales engagement and marketing automation. And how can they play together? Because I keep hearing account-based marketing and all this other shit. And it's just like, really, I, I, ha I really have yet to see a company crush account-based marketing the way it's supposed, like the way it's painted on a, on a picture, right? Um, you know, being super authentic, being very direct, only serving up information that's direct. I mean, the only, the only people that do true account-based marketing, uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon right? Because they know everything that I do and they're serving me up shit. And I'm like, yeah, I, actually, I want that. I didn't know that was a thing. Give me that, right? That's account-based marketing that I've seen, but I haven't seen a B2B do it really well. So how do you see the intersection of, of sales engagement tools and marketing automation working together in the, in the world moving forward? Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, I, I, I'm a big, I was a big early fan of marketing automation. I started sales off in the part on offices. Um, but I will say that my personal and our business use of marketing automation has just gone like this yeah. um, to where now it is relegated to um, some landing pages, some um, opt in subscriber communities that receive a newsletter yep. and that's it. Mm -hmm. That's marketing automation. Now account base, a little different uh, account base is interesting because it's like, it's a way of life but it's not a category of, of products. Right? Yeah. If you look at the account-based marketing quadrant, you're like, hold on, that's apples and trucks and rocket ships and chairs, you know? They don't do the same thing. But what we've done from an account-based perspective, and it's all mapped out in our personal sales opt account, yeah. is we first we say, okay, who are the targets? Who are the target accounts? And we use all sorts of data and intelligence and information to say, here they are, you know, here's the, Here's the um, commercial market accounts. Here's the enterprise accounts. Then what we do is we say, okay, here's how we're going to distribute those to all of the AEs, not just the SDRs, the AEs first. And then SDRs are assigned to those accounts as well. So now you've got teams working accounts with playbooks and game plans of how they're communicating with them. And then marketing is bucketing those accounts in certain segments so they can run campaigns to them. Okay. And so that's the way it works. And, and we, we home grew some software, you know, Jeremy Donovan, uh, that name he's, he's with us and he runs our New York office and our sales strategy. He built software from scratch that looks at every target account in the universe and identifies the ones that are right for us with like this 27 point inspection. And then it distributes all of those to each and every rep so that each rep gets an equal opportunity in their target account list. And, uh, and then it, we just monitor it as it goes through sales loft. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, like I said, I think you and I could have this conversation for, for and we do when we get together. So we're going we're gonna to cut it off a little we're bit. We're do that soon in uh, three weeks and counting, man. Can't wait to have, see, see your sessions and have you in town. Yeah, me too. So actually, that was, that was my question. That was my final question. Like, what are you most fired up for about Rainmaker? Colin O'Brady. Colin O'Brady, yeah? This Why? guy, I mean, he, he, he was in Thailand um, had a bad fire incident, burned up his legs. The doctors told him he never would walk. Two and a half years later, he won the tri Chicago Triathlon. A few years after that, he became the first human being to scale the top peak in every single continent in the fastest period of time. And then two years after that, he just got back from Antarctica, where he went coast to coast Antarctica, 53 days, unaided, unassisted, solo, dragging a 350 pound sled of his food and uh, in this minus 60 degree blizzards. And on the very last 80 miles of this trip, he'd been doing about 20 miles a day. In the last 80 miles, he decided to pack it all in and 48 hours straight, just finished. Just Jeez. one straight run, uh, 80 miles. It got to the finish line. There was no one there to celebrate him because it's Antarctica. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, shit, you know, to a certain degree, that makes me feel bad about myself. It's like, <laughs> man, I'm such a fucking loser compared to somebody like that. Like, shit. But, but I think it does go to, to the, you know, the mental toughness. And, and so I, I'm assuming that's the connection here. Like, you just got to oh, keep yeah. power through, right? <laughs> well, believing in yourself is everything, right? S sales is all about a fundamental belief in yourself and your offering and your company and transferring that belief to someone else. I know you and I talk about that. And, and uh, you know, if you believe, then you can make it across the Antarctic. Yeah, you gotta have it. And, and by the way, right after I talked to Colin, I was in the kitchen at Sales Loft, yeah. and some guy came in, and someone asked him how he's doing, and he's like, 
oh, a little tired. And then he goes, well, what's happening? He's like, man, I've been working. We had partners in town for two days straight, and I worked late. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Well, it's funny you say that because I was just at a sales kickoff recently where the guy ahead of me, so it was a two-day thing. I came in and did my training on day two. Day one was a motivational speaker, and it was, a, it was a Navy SEAL who had literally gotten his face blown off. Like, IED, boom, blew his face off, and, and they reconstructed it and everything else, and he's up there, and he's like, so, and he starts, he goes like this. He goes, who in here has had a bad day? And, you know, everybody raises their hand. Yeah, we've all had bad days. Like, I'm calling bullshit on every single one of you. And he was like, <laughs> he's like, you want to hear bad day? And he goes ahead and explains, like, what happens to him. And afterwards, you're like, yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> like, the worst day of my life is it doesn't hold a candle to something yeah, like it's that. It's like 30 seconds of his day. <laughs> I think that, you know, just gets all in perspective, right? So... Anyways, Kyle, uh, awesome, man. I, I was, as Good always, times as always. And uh, I can't wait for Rainmaker, man. It's going to be fire. So, again, Likewise. Uh, we're going to put this out there. Uh, I'll put a discount code that everybody can jump on board. Uh, I'm going to put some resources as far as your uh, sales development uh, study that you put out there as well. But anything else you want uh, people to know about before we take off here? Hey, you know, just keep, keep, watching, this, uh, keep watching this podcast and stay in tune to John Barrow's. You know, I've learned a ton of skills from you, John. And if it wasn't for the things you've been doing in the market, we wouldn't have built this company how it is. So I'm just so appreciative and deeply grateful for you and, and grateful for this audience for hearing us out. Awesome, brother. I appreciate it. Well, I will see you. Oh, and by the way, thanks for the, by the way, my wife still, those tangerines, man, bananas. And, <laughs> and thank you for helping out my daughter with her, with her Girl Scout cookie sales, man. I really appreciate oh, it. Awesome. Well, uh, it's our pleasure. See you, John. Right. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Bye.